So today we're going to talk about enzymes. Enzymes are catalysts that speed up the rate of a chemical reaction without being used up in the process. So typically we think of enzymes as proteins, but they can also be RNA molecules as well. So um, RNA molecules can work to act as enzymes processing ribosomal RNA. So enzymes work by temporarily binding to a substrate and lowering the activation energy needed to convert that substrate into products. Enzymes also work by binding individual to individual products and then converting them into a single substrate. So in this diagram you can see the, the first method where you've got a free enzyme and a free substrate and then the enzyme substrate complex forms ES and then um, the enzyme product complex forms EP and then the free products are released and the enzyme is recycled to um, bind again to substrates. So this is an example of an enzyme binding um, its substrate. So this enzyme is the uh, a very small protein called lysozyme and so here lysozyme is binding a carbohydrate and so this is the binding site for the enzyme and in green is the carbohydrate. So without the carbohydrate present you can see there's kind of a cleft in the molecule. So what you're really getting then is a kind of a surface to surface interaction between the substrate and the enzyme and so there's all kinds of contacts forming um, that, are, that are forming weak bonds, weak easily reversible bonds. So that enzyme active site then is on the, loc is on the surface and the substrates bind and what you get is this specific substrate interaction that occurs at the active site. Usually what you see is that other substrates don't fit very well into the active site and that makes it a specific reaction. Um, in some enzymes they're able to bind a variety of different substrates but they have a, a preference or a tighter fit with one substrate over another. So here in the, the case of the lysozyme, different types of carbohydrates potentially could be binding in there, but um, some of them are going to work better than others. So this bond then that's going on, this surface interaction between the substrate and the enzyme, is stabilized by weak interactions. It's not a covalent bond. Um, that is what you're getting for the peptide bond in the backbone of the, of the enzyme or the phosphodiester bond in the backbone of a DNA or RNA molecule. So these weak interactions then are hydrogen bonds, electrostatic interactions, hydrophobic contacts, and van der Waals forces. So uh, the fact that you can bind and then reverse enables the enzyme to uh, process uh, substrate into product. So people think of enzymes as working in several different ways. Um, they think of it by reaction mechanism, they think of it as the, the geometry of the molecule, and they think about it as energy changes in the process of the reactions. So we're going to talk about how all of these different ways of looking at the enzyme um, shine a light on different aspects of enzymes, enzymes. So as I've said, enzymes bind substrate and convert it into a product. So uh, the enzyme and substrate then form this enzyme substrate complex. The enzyme substrate then transfers it to product and enzymes. So you can think of it as going from substrate to product with these rate constants um, canceling out. So in fact the reaction can go both ways. Um, the, the product, the, this K2 reaction and this K1 versus K negative 1 reaction
these different reaction rates are what drive the, the reaction forward from substrate to product. So as I said, enzymes can reverse the reaction and K1 and K2 can have different rates of chemical reaction. So that would force the enzyme to go forward in a particular direction. So this is another way of looking at it. Often people refer to this as kind of a, a lock and key mechanism. So the idea is that the enzyme is going to fit tightly to the substrate. The enzyme substrate complex is then going to shift and the enzyme then will um, change the geometry of the product and the product then will break a covalent bond. So the enzymes speed up this breakage or formation of a covalent bond. And the interaction between the enzyme and the substrate is a non-covalent interaction. So the enzyme reaction rate is determined by measuring the, the rate of formation of product. So we abbreviate this as the, the product in, in brackets. And this is called the velocity of the reaction. And velocity is symbolized by the, the abbreviated letter V. So VI is the initial velocity of the enzyme. So now thinking about molecular geometry, uh, the substrate molecule is fitting into the active side of the enzyme like a key fitting into a lock. And once there, the enzyme changes shape, distorts the molecule in the active site, and makes it more likely to change into the product. So if a bond in the substrate is broken, then that bond might be stretched by the enzyme, making it more likely to break. Or the enzyme can make local conditions inside the active site quite different from those outside the active site. Um, the pH can shift. There could be a water concentration. There could be a charge. Um, in the case of DNA polymerases and DNA restriction enzymes, there's a magnesium ion brought into close contact with a bond. Um, and and that, lo that geometry then increases the rate of the reaction. It, it increases the likelihood that that reaction of breaking or forming a covalent bond is going to happen. So even though enzymes can change the speed of a chemical reaction, they really don't change its direction. Otherwise, they would make impossible things happen. And when you make impossible reactions happen, you break the laws of thermodynamics. So an enzyme can just as easily turn a product into a substrate as turn a substrate into a product, depending on which way the reaction would go. So the active site doesn't really fit the substrate or the product all that well, but it instead fits a sort of halfway transition state. So when a substrate or product molecule binds, the active site changes shape and fits itself around the molecule, distorting it into forming the transition state and speeding up the reaction. And this has been referred to as an induced fit mechanism. So now thinking about ener energy changes. So generally what people talk about is the, the energy of activation. So when a product has a lower energy than the substrate, how can the substrate naturally turn into the product? So before it can change into a product, the substrate has to overcome this energy barrier. And so the larger this activation energy is, the slower the reaction will be, because only a few substrate molecules by chance will have sufficient energy to overcome this activation energy barrier. So when you're pushing a boulder up over a hill before it can roll back down a hill, um, you realize you have to push a lot of energy to get the rock up the hill and then the energy is expended rolling back down the hill. So most physiological reactions have large energy activation. So they don't happen on a, on a useful time scale. So what enzymes do then is reduce the activation energy of the reaction so that instead of pushing the rock over a really huge hill,
you're pushing the rock over a much smaller hill. And so then the molecules can easily get over the energy barrier and quickly turn into product. So the enzyme creates a microenvironment in which A and B can reach the transition state AEB more easily, reducing the amount of energy needed to form. Um, so this is the energy required to change from A plus B into AB. And if you can reduce that energy state, then you only require this smaller amount of energy E2. Since the lower energy rate state is easier to reach, it occurs more frequently, so that improves the speed of the reaction. So often when people talk about enzymes, they talk about enzyme kinetics. So the study of the rate at which an enzyme works is enzyme kinetics. And enzyme kinetics is a function of the concentration of the substrate available to the enzyme. So whenever you're talking about enzyme kinetics, you've always had, you're doing calculations based on a particular substrate concentration. So how do we measure enzyme reactions in the laboratory? Well, first you need a signal that's going to measure the progress of the reaction. And that signal should change with either the concentration of the substrate or the concentration of the product. And it, preferably, it should be something that's measured continuously. If it's, a, if it's an on-off switch, it's not going to be as informative as if it's something that changes on a gradient. So some of the changes um, as a signal that are used are color changes. That's what we use in our lab in the maltose color reagent. Um, pH changes can also occur, um, mass changes can occur, gas production can occur, you can change the volume, and um, one of my favorites, you can change the turbidity of a solution. So a solution goes from being clear to being turbid. If the reaction has none of these properties, what people do is link it to a secondary reaction. So for example, pH changes often are hooked up with a color indicator. So the initial um, enzyme reaction changes the pH of the solution, and then the changed pH is reported on by a colored reporter molecule that reports on the pH of the solution changing. So this is a diagram of um, the carbohydrate amylet, uh, the carbohydrate starch binding into the enzyme amylase. And so this is the active site, here's our substrate, this is the protein chain, and you've got this kind of surface interaction going on. So the enzyme amylase is binding starch and producing maltose. It also produces a few other um, carbohydrates as well as maltose. So in our lab, what we're, do, what we're doing are enzyme kinetics in lab two. We've purchased purified alpha amylase from Bacillus leuciniformis, and our goal is to measure its activity by measuring the appearance of maltose. So the first thing we're going to do in the lab is make a maltose standard curve. So we interact known concentrations of maltose with a reagent, the maltose color reagent, which produces a color change in the presence of the maltose. Then we measure the color change in the spectrophotometer set to read that, that color of light. So just to remind you how spectrophotometers work, um, the human eye can see the complementary color to the color that's absorbed. So this um, beam of light is coming through the cuvette where the molecules are present. And this, all these colors are coming through and they hit the eye, but the light that's been absorbed is the green light in this case. So we perceive this then as this purple color, purple-pink color, but the light that's absorbed is the green. So when you're measuring the absorbance, 
you want to set the, set the spectrophotometer to the wavelength of the light that's absorbed. So the absorbed color, for example, is red, and the complementary color is blue-green. This is the one I always remember because um, plants absorb light in the red color range, and so when we look at plants, we see a blue or blue-green color plant. So the, the plants are absorbing the red colored light, and we see the complement. So if we are seeing kind of an orange color, then we're seeing a greenish-blue color. And if we're seeing a red color, then we're the, the light that's being absorbed is a bluish-green. So I think in our maltose color assay, we're, we're reading that around 540. So the light color that's being absorbed is more of a green color, and we're seeing kind of a reddish-purple color. We also kind of see a brown um, background color as well. So in order to use a standard, what you do is you follow the Beer-Lambert, um, beer Booger lambert Law, which says that um, the, you can calculate the negative log of I over IO, um, and that is epsilon times B times C. So C is the concentration of substrate, B is the cuvette length, and epsilon is the molar extinction coefficient. So I've got a link here to reading more about molar extinction coefficients. So it's this um, extinction coefficient is unique for every molecule. So if you have a pure molecule and you have a, a known um, absorbance and you know your cuvette path length, which in our lab is a centimeter, it's a standard cuvette length, um, you can put in the, the coefficient epsilon and use that to determine the concentration of the unknown. You can also extrapolate from your curve. So we're spending a lot of our time extrapolating from our curve. So in our lab two, what we did was we calculated the unit activity. So a unit of, act of enzyme can be defined as the amount of enzyme that will liberate a micromole of product in one minute. So an unknown enzyme concentration is defined as the units based on careful timing of a reaction and measurement of the amount of product released from the reaction. So unit activity also requires knowing how much protein is in the solution. So that's why we um, calculated the protein concentration and used that as an estimate of how much material was made. So it's the amount of enzyme that will liber liberate a micromole of product in one milliliter in one minute. So I forgot the part about a milliliter. So now that is under standard defined conditions. So if you do your enzyme assay in a different condition, you're going to get a different um, measurement of unit activity. So if you do your reaction at 37 degrees, you'll get a different answer than if you do your reaction at room temperature. So unit activity, though, is one of the important things that people calculate for enzymes. So as I've said, what we've done is created with our Malto standard curve a way of measuring concentrations. So in our lab, then, one of our goals that is to avoid very low um, concentrations or very high concentrations, because under those, you're, you're not going to be in the most linear, accurate part of the standard curve. So what you're doing, then, is plotting concentration on the x-axis and then absorbance is plotted on the y-axis. Then you measure the amount of absorbance in your enzyme e experiment, and from that you can extrapolate out
how much um, glucose per liter is being created uh, in that particular enzyme reaction. So if we go back to our unit activity assay, um, then we know what we're interested in is, is how much of the product is being created. So the activity of the enzyme is being, being determined based on how much product it's making. So in this case, we're measuring the product. So it, we're also going to, besides calculating unit activity in lab three, we try and determine the optimal conditions for the enzyme. So we calculate the enzyme's activity at several different pHs. So we're making starch, which is our substrate, and we do it at pH 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. Then we figure out at that which of these is producing the most product. We do the same thing with the different temperatures. And the question we're asking is which temperature allows the same amount of enzyme to make the most product. So that tells you what its optimal conditions are. Um, you can compare different enzymes with the same function to see if these optimal conditions differ. So in the lichenoformis enzyme, um, are the conditions the same as the conditions for um, the porcine enzyme or the enzyme from, from rice, from orzai? So when you're... Um, doing this, when you're first figuring this out, one of the things that you do is, is mix your substrate with your enzyme and then measure the signal. And then you're going to measure how much product is made over time. So if the signal is proportionate to the substrate concentration, it will start high and then decrease. And if the signal is proportionate to product, it will start low and increase. So, for example, we talked in our lab about studying the enzyme alpha amylase with our maltose color reagent. In that case, what we're measuring is an increase in the amount of product that we're making. We could do an enzyme assay based on iodine absorption of the starch. And then as we reduce the starch to maltose, we lose the ability of the purple color to be absorbed by the starch. And what we do is see the substrate fall off over time. So depending on the assay you choose, you're either measuring the loss of substrate or the increase of product. So in both cases, though, the time course will be curved. So you do these kind of enzyme time courses in a substrate excess. So you're putting a lot of a, a, a lot of substrate and then watch it fall off over time. So how do you obtain a rate from the time course? So one thing that it is not a good idea to measure is the time taken for the reaction. The time course shows it's very difficult to say when the reaction ends. It just gradually approaches the end point. So if we look at our, our chart here, you can see that the maximum amount of protein is reached very gradually. And um, taking the substrate down to zero is also reached very gradually. So a better method is to measure the initial rate of the enzyme, the initial slope at the time of the time course. And that part of the enzyme reaction is a linear slope. And it also means you don't need to record the whole time course but simply take one measurement a short time after mixing. So in the case of our uh, experiment that we do in the lab, what we're doing is letting the enzyme mix with a large amount of starch and then waiting 12 minutes. And then we stop that reaction and measure how much maltose the enzyme has made. So to measure enzyme activity, we set up a series of tubes containing an increasing concentration of substrate. One tube will have no substrate and be the control, and at time zero, we'll add a fixed amount of the enzyme preparation to every tube. And then over the next few minutes, we measure the concentration of the product formed. 
if the product absorbs light, we can easily do this in a spectrophotometer. So in fact, um, people will take a cuvette, mix the substrate in, and then um, put it in a spectrophotometer, and then measure the, the sample, the cuvette, every minute, over 12 minutes, and then take those, that data and then plot that. So early in the run when the substrate is in substantial excess to the amount of enzyme, what you're going to observe is the initial velocity, or VI. So in this kind of a plot then, the, you're measuring the initial VI, and you're doing it as the substrate concentration increases. So this enables you to figure out a substrate concentration that will give you a rate um, that's the maximal rate. So you repeat this um, initial rate measurement under different conditions and then plot the graph of rate versus the factor. And then at each point on the second graph is taken from a separate initial rate measurement. And then that will allow you to draw a smooth curve through the points and get you ultimately to your maximum velocity of the enzyme. So what is it, when we do our experiments in the lab, one of the things that we have to consider is that when you're mixing your samples and doing a timed reaction and you're mixing series of experiments, um, there's just a certain amount of error. You have error in pipetting, you have error in setting up your experiment to go the exact same number of minutes and seconds. Uh, you have error opening the tube and adding the stop solution to read the sample. So there's um, a lot of error. So when people do enzyme reactions like this, they typically take multiple measurements. They, they repeat the experiment um, multiple times and then average the results in order to get to an approximation of a really accurate reality. So as we mentioned, enzymes work by making reactions go faster. So enzymes, though, they're still physical beings, and they have to follow the law of physics and the conservation of energy. But enzymes can couple two or more reactions and so that a thermodynamically favorable reaction can be used to drive a thermodynamically unfavorable reaction. In other words, running the reaction backwards or uphill. So that process can make reactions go a lot faster. So one of the ways in which that happens is that the concentration of the reactants matters. So the direction of any chemical reaction is based only on the energy balance between the two sides of the reaction equation. So if there's very little change in net free energy between substrate and product, the reaction is considered reversible, easily reversible. So you're constantly toggling back and forth between um, enzyme and substrate and then enzyme and product. So the substrate flips back and forth being product back to substrate, product back to substrate depending on which side of the reaction is more concentrated, then it drives the reaction in the, direction, in the other direction. So if there's lots and lots of product and not very much substrate, then the reaction can be driven back in the direction of the substrate. So if you have linked reactions, what happens is you can have a substrate uh, added and then the product forms, and if the next enzyme uses that product in the next reaction, then you wind up with a, a constantly replenishing, um, you have a lot of substrate, but your product is constantly being used up, so it drives the reaction in the direction of forming the product. So the rate at which an enzyme works then is influenced by several different factors. So we mentioned that enzymes have optimal temperatures and that one of the experiments we would do in our alpha amylase experiment lab three 
was um, determining the optimal temperature for different enzymes. So in mammalian enzymes, this optimal temperature is usually somewhere around 40 degrees. Um, some, and that makes sense because mammals are usually at around 37 degrees and an optimal temperature that works at a, even a little bit warmer temperature is fine. So if you purify the enzymes and try and figure out their optimal temperature though, they may work at a, a different optimum as a purified enzyme. Um, so the environmental temperature which it, the organism maintains may influence the rate of the, of the enzyme reaction. So for example, enzymes in the Arctic snow flea work best at minus 10 degrees centigrade. And enzymes from thermophilic bacteria work well at 90 degrees centigrade. So people often go out then to isolate enzymes from novel bacteria or organisms that live in extreme climates with the goal of identifying an enzyme that can work at different extremes of temperature. So up to the optimum temperature, the rate increases usually geometrically with the temperature. Um, it's a curve, not a straight line. So the rate increases because the enzyme and the substrate molecules have more kinetic energy. So they are colliding more often and also because more molecules have sufficient energy to overcome the activation energy. So all as you warm things up, everything's bouncing around and moving around more quickly. So the increase in rate with the temperature can be quantified as a, a relative increase for per 10 degree centigrade rise in temperature. And this is referred to as the Q10. So the rate is not zero at zero degrees centigrade. So enzymes are still working in the refrigerator and the food still goes off in the refrigerator over time. But those enzymes are working more slowly. So enzymes can even work in ice, although the rate is extremely slow due to the very slow diffusion of the enzyme and substrate molecules through the ice lattice. So if you've got a bunch of enzymes frozen in a block of ice, they can still be activating a reaction, but the, rea the substrate molecules are going to find a hard time finding the active site. All that's going to work better when it's warmer. But above the optimum temperature, the rate decreases. So what's usually happening is that the enzyme molecules themselves are losing their geometric shape that enables them to have that particular surface area or pocket with its charged um, amino acids that are going to interact with the substrate. So the, what happens is the thermal energy breaks the hydrogen bonds holding the secondary and tertiary structure of the enzyme together so that the enzyme and especially the active site of the enzyme loses its shape and so instead of being a nice um, alpha helix or beta pleated sheet area with a nice surface area to interact what happens is it becomes a random coil and then the substrate can't bind because the substrate is not recognizing that same surface or pocket and so the reaction doesn't really move forward very well. So at, at very high temperatures this is irreversible in most enzymes. Um, a few very um, stalwart enzymes can renature and reform their secondary and tertiary structure as an active enzyme after they cool down from being boiled. RNase is one of those tough enzymes. But most enzymes um, when they're boiled or overly heated lose their active site permanently. So at, there's only weak hydrogen bonds that are broken at mild temperatures. So to break strong covalent bonds you really need to break them down by boiling them in concentrated acid to break them. You know, they're really not going to break um, easily on their own. So um, the, you need another enzyme, in fact, to help break the backbone of the 
peptide backbone or the phosphodiester backbone. So you also will see a three-dimensional shape of a protein that's influenced by pH, just like they're influenced by heat. So that makes sense then that over time, over different pHs, the enzyme activity is going to have an optimal pH because the enzyme's three-dimensional shape um, is going to be influenced by pH. So, um, and again, that's because the, the side R groups of the amino acids sticking into the enzyme are going to um, change their charge with different pHs and change their three-dimensional interaction. And so that binding site is going to fall apart, basically. And so there are enzymes that work at extremes of pH. Uh, so the protease enzymes in animal stomachs often have extreme tolerance for low pH. And some enzymes, um, especially ones that are able to tolerate um, very high pH, uh, are going to be useful in, for example, laundry detergents, which are often at um, a, a base kind of pH. So the th you see, again, these kinds of curves for the different pH optimum. And this is something people typically do. In the articles we're reading on alpha amylase, you'll notice many experiments are done with different temperature and different pH to find the optimum for the enzymes. So enzyme concentration um, is important to characterize. So when you make a bunch of protein, how much of it is active enzyme? So as the enzyme concentration increases, the rate of the reaction increases linearly because there's more enzyme molecules that are available to catalyze the reaction. So at very high enzyme concentrations, the substrate concentration becomes the rate limiting factor. So the rate stops increasing. Normally what you see in cells is the enzymes are present in very low concentration and there's plenty of substrate. So, but if you're really trying to figure stuff out about rate, um, you want to keep the substrate concentration constant. So the, the rate of an enzyme catalyzed reaction then is showing this kind of dependence on substrate concentration. And as the substrate concentration increases, the rate increases um, because there's more substrate to bump into. So at, at higher concentrations, the enzyme molecules become saturated with substrate. So there's very few free enzyme molecules present anymore so adding more substrate doesn't make much difference, although it does increase the, the rate of the enzyme-substrate collisions. So my analogy on this is you have a, you are guys going to ladies' night at the bar. So when you're guys going to lady, ladies' night at the bar, the ladies could be considered the substrate and the guys could be considered the, the enzymes. So if there's an excess of ladies at the bar, the chance of the guys running into a lady and, and um, have finding a, a partner for a date uh, becomes good because there's lots of, lots of opportunities for uh, meeting and interacting with ladies. So if, the, if there's very few ladies, in large numbers of guys, it's more comparable to large numbers of enzymes. So the, it, the rate of meeting ladies is going to go down. But, you know, it, so there's a fixed amount of, of substrate present. And an excess of enzyme, then the enzyme is what's going to dictate how much of the substrate gets converted. So enzyme activity then is increasing with substrate concentration. So guys dating is going to increase with concentrations of available girls to date. So what people do then is they plot the 
the VI as a function of substrate concentration. So at low values of substrate, the initial velocity rises almost linearly with increasing substrate. But as substrate increases, the gains in VI level level off, forming this kind of rectangular hyperbola. The asymptote represents the maximum velocity of the reaction, and that's designated V max. So mathematically, the substrate concentration that produces a VI that is one half of V max is designated the michaelis menten constant, or the Km. So let's look at it on a curve. So these are initial VIs that are being measured as substrate increases. So if this is our alpha amylase experiment, um, you're putting increasing amounts of substrate and holding the enzyme concentration constant. And what you're doing is checking to see at what point the substrate concentration, um, just adding more and more substrate, uh, doesn't increase the amount of product formed. So the, what that means is that becomes essentially the actual ability of the enzyme to convert um, substrate to product. So what you're looking at is increasing amounts of substrate, each with an initial VI calculation done at a fixed unit of enzyme. So this then is the one half V max, and the Km is the concentration of substrate there. So if you have an enzyme that um, has a, a different rate of reaction, the Km is going to be either higher or lower. So this one ha requires not very much substrate, in order to reach a pretty good activity. In another case, the Km might require a larger amount of substrate in order to reach the maximum velocity. So the one that has the, the Km here is different than the one that has the Km over here. So the activity of some enzymes is controlled by other enzymes. So one of the factors in, in gene regulation is that enzymes themselves can be held as in, in an inactive site, in an inactive state, until some part of the active site of the enzyme is modified. So that modification could be um, adding a phosphate group to the protein chain, adding a methyl group, um, putting a phosphate on a serine, taking one off. So the modification then can turn an inactive enzyme into an active enzyme, or it can turn an active enzyme into an inactive enzyme. For some enzymes, um, there's a cleavage of an a, a inactive subunit into an active subunit by a protease, so that's often not as reversible. But for many of these, they're reversible. and other ones, they're not reversible. So for example, hydrochloric acid and low pH in the stomach activates the, the pepsin, and that activates the, the renin as well in the um, covalent modification of the, these enzymes in the stomach. So enzyme inhibition can occur when the active site of many enzymes are suppressed by the presence of another molecule. So an enzyme inhibitor then is something that can come in and inhibit the activity of the enzyme, reducing the rate of the reaction. So there are a lot of enzyme inhibitions that are important, and they're used in very important um, as important tools. So for example, one way to um, act against a, 
uh, an activity like proteases that are present would be to add an inhibitor that would alter the activity of the protease. If the protease is activating a virus, for example, HIV has a virus protease that comes in and cleaves one long polypeptide into a series of smaller polypeptides. And when that occurs, the virus is activated. So a popular drug um, against HIV is for a um, inhibitor to come and alter the activity of the HIV protease, thereby slowing down the infectivity of the virus. So enzyme inhibitors are very popularly used as drugs. They can be used as pesticides and they're used as research tools to characterize the function of an enzyme. So we're going to talk about three types of enzyme inhibition. Competitive inhibition, non-competitive inhibition, and something known as uncompetitive inhibition. So competitive inhibition is probably the easiest one to understand. So in this case, the active site itself is blocked when a molecule similarly similar to the the substrate binds and that molecule is able to bind in the active site but can't be processed by the enzyme so the substrate can't bind if the active site is filled with some other um, inhibitor so in some cases the inhibitor has tighter binding than the substrate does because remember, the substrate's got to be able to go in, get modified, and hop out. So it doesn't make sense that the substrate's going to have super tight binding for the active site of the enzyme. Um, whereas the inhibitor, if you can find an inhibitor with very, very tight binding that can go in and compete, then that's really going to shut off those enzymes. They're not going to be able to go forward. It's going to the enzyme inhibitor complex is going to form and you're not going to get any product. So competitive inhibitor molecules have similar structures to the, the normal substrate molecule and they can fit into the active site of the enzyme. So it's competing with the substrate for the active site and so the reaction is slower. So what competitive inhibitors do is increase the Km for an enzyme but they have no effect overall on the Vmax rate. So the rate can approach a normal rate if there's enough substrate concentration present. Um, so there's a lot of drugs that are competitive inhibitors. The, the sulfonamide antibacterial drugs are an example of a competitive inhibitor. Another um, competitive inhibitor that's used as an HIV drug is um, azo-T and so the azo-T azothymine is going to have an azo group instead of a, a free 5 prime a free 3 prime hydroxyl group so that azo group isn't going to be able to make a growing chain of nucleic acid because it lacks a free 3 prime end and so as a result it's going to block nucleic acid replication in the HIV virus or other viruses. Now non-competitive inhibition, um, the inhibitor binds to the enzyme at a site other than the active site and that causes a structural change uh, in the enzyme so that the active site is rendered useless. It distorts the active site so the substrate can't bind or even if it binds, it binds and it can't be released. So when the inhibitor is present, then the substrate can't bind, so you get no reaction occurring. So non-competitive inhibitors are often quite different in structure from the substrate molecule, and they don't fit into the active site. They bind to another part of the enzyme molecule. And non-competitive inhibitors simply reduce the amount of enzyme activity overall. 
it works like you've decreased the enzyme concentration. So they decrease the Vmax, but they have no effect on the Km. So the, the rate at which molecules are jumping in and out, substrate molecule is jumping in and out of the active site, is the same for all the ones that don't have an inhibitor bound. So that the, um, the Km doesn't alter, just the, the Vmax. Now, uncompetitive inhibition is similar to non-competitive inhib inhibition, except that in this case, the inhibitor can only bind the enzyme substrate complex rather than the free enzyme. So when that occurs, um, the enzyme and substrate bind, and then the inhibitor hops on and reduces the enzyme substrate complex becoming product. So when you're looking at the effects on the michaelin menten kinetics, this is one of the favorite questions to ask on exams. So you, and you can ask a gazillion true-false type questions about this. So remember, in the competitive inhibition, the Vmax is the same, because ultimately, you're going to get to the same amount of product being made, because over time, the inhibitor is going to be hopping in and out, and the, the substrate's going to be hopping in and out and changing into product, and it's just going to slow everything down. But ultimately, with enough time, um, the enzyme will turn all the substrate into product, because you haven't um, altered the shape of the, the site. So, um, but what is going to change is the, the Vmax. So the the one half V max or Km is going to shift over here. So this was the original Km for the original no inhibitor enzyme. And now that shifts over here. So one half of of this is going to shift over um, because it's no longer in the same position. So even though it's still going to the same maximum, this position is a different substrate concentration. So if you want the, the one half rate to be the same, you have to add a lot more substrate. Now in the non-competitive inhibition, it's as if we've reduced the overall concentration of the enzyme. So the Vmax just never goes up as high. And remember, in these kinds of experiments, the enzyme concentration is fixed, and it's the substrate that's increasing. So here, in this non-competitive inhibition, interestingly, the one-half Vmax is much lower than the one-half Vmax here, uh, but the Km is the same, because it's at the same position in the curve. So it's as if you've reduced the concentration of enzyme, but the Km is in the same position. Now, people do like to use uh, Lineweaver Burke plots. So what these are, are looking at the slope as the Km, the slope of a line is the Km divided by the Vmax. So this then is, plot, is obtained by plotting 1 over the substrate concentration versus 1 over the Vi. And so what this enables you to do then is um, plot your results and then more easily solve for um, what Km is. Because when you're looking at this kind of a curve, sometimes it's hard to calculate exactly where um, one half Vmax is to calculate your Km. But here, um, you can calculate the Km very readily because that's where this line is going to intersect. Um, so you can use this to calculate the Km. So this is the negative one over Km. So when you do this, then you can see different plots as well of the lineweaver burke plots. So um, the red is the normal. When Vmax is the same, they cross. 
on this y-axis. And when um, km is changed the same, they come to the same position for km. So here on the competitive inhibition, you see that the km is shifted, but the vmax hasn't. And on the non-competitive inhibition, you see that the, um, the vmax has shifted and the km hasn't. So it can be very easy to calculate these. So we can also talk about allosteric effectors. So the activity of some enzymes is controlled by certain molecules that bind to a specific regulatory site on the enzyme distinct from the active site. And this can be referred to as an allosteric site. And the different molecules then can inhibit or activate the enzyme, allowing sophisticated control of the rate so that instead of it being completely an inhibitor, it can shift or activate an enzyme or slow it down. And only a few enzymes do this, and they are often at the start of a long biochemical pathway. And they're generally activated by the substrate of the pathway and inhibited by the product of the pathway. So those allosteric inhibitors then are going to be turned bind the, the final product of a, a series of enzymatic reactions in a biochemical pathway. So that as soon as you have a larger concentration of product, the, that amount of product comes along and binds to the, the initial enzyme in the pathway and turns the pathway off because you've made enough. You don't need to keep making product. So these allosteric enzymes often have multiple subunits with a complex quaternary structure. And multiple subunits means that the individual catalytic subunits each have their own active site. So that can mean that an enzyme with quaternary structure can bind more than one substrate molecule and can bind one, more than one inhibitor molecule. So that leads you to have more complex um, curves instead of those nice simple um, curves that we were looking at in the beginning. So here we've got a fairly simple allosteric enzyme molecule. So here is the active site and this is the allosteric site. So this sub, there's two subunits, here's the allosteric sites, here's the two active sites. So when the substrate binds here, that can even shift this subunit so that it increases the rate of substrate binding here. When, the, at, when an enzyme is activated, it can increase the activity of the other binding site. When it's inactive, the allosteric inhibitor can shift the shape so that the catalytic subunit is decreased and may even increase the binding of a second allosteric inhibitor. So allosteri, allo means different, and steric means shape. So allosteri means different shape. And allosteric enzymes change shape between the active and the inactive shape because of the binding of the substrate at the active site and the binding of regulatory molecules at other sites, the allosteric sites. And in the simple case of an allosteric enzyme with an active and an inactive form, the change in the reaction rate with increasing substrate concentration is typically an S-shaped curve instead of being a nice parabolic curve like we were looking at earlier. So allosteric enzymes can also have regulatory subunits that can bind either activators or inhibitors. And the inhibitors cause the allosteric enzyme to adopt an inactive shape. So the activators promote the active shape and there's an equilibrium that's existing between the active and the inactive shapes. So the amount of active and inactive enzyme is dependent on the relative concentrations of substrate and inhibitor. So I mentioned before that these allosteric enzymes are often on the, at the first point of the pathway. So this enzyme makes, converts substrate A into B, B is converted into C, C is converted into D, and then D comes and feeds back 
to inhibit enzyme 1 and shut off the pathway to making too much D. So, as I said, the binding of the zealosteric inhibitors shift the enzyme to an inactive shape, and it can even promote the cooperative binding of a second inhibitor. So an excess of substrate can overcome this inhibitor effect, and then substrate binding will cause the enzyme to assume the active shape and allow cooperative binding that increases the amount of additional substrate binding, leading to more product formation. So these are those kind of S-shaped curves then. So when you have an inhibitor then, what it does is it changes the amount of substrate that you have to overcome the inhibitor. But you still see this kind of cooperative binding um, that occurs. So in the beginning, um, at the low substrate concentration, you don't have a lot of activity. When it shifts, though, and it starts binding a lot of substrate, the enzyme becomes more active. And instead of getting a nice linear region, you get this kind of S-shaped curve. When you add the inhibitor and you increase the substrate concentration, you basically shift the S-shaped curve to up in the, in the substrate concentration. So that's what we've got for enzyme activity. I hope this has been helpful and helps put the experiments we did in IST340 in context. Thanks.